Hello, and welcome back to part two of the Dynamite Cop video. Today we are going to be taking a look at mission two, but this time I will be playing as Gene Ivy. And now, as opposed to mission one, where we parachuted onto the boat, this time we're actually going by uh, these, like, these little uh, rib boats into the uh, boat. And that's one thing I like about this game is, even though all of the missions are more or less the same game, they all kind of add like their own little element and like story piece to it. And as you will see as we go through this video, some of the actual story scenes are a bit different in this version of it as opposed to um, the mission one. And of course, some of these scenes here are going to be similar to some of the other missions, but the enemies that you actually fight in a lot of these scenes are going to be different than they were in other missions that have the same scenes. Although, a lot of the weapons that you get, like this anchor I remember being here when I was fighting as another character, are actually the same weapons, but there's just a lot of different enemies that you can actually fight in a lot of these scenes, like... You'll remember in the mission one, it wasn't until a different mission where you fought this turtle guy. I always think of that episode of uh, Ninja Turtles with the uh, the crooked Ninja Turtle gang, and then there's another episode in Ninja Turtles that had like these really big turtle guys who uh, made fun of the puny Ninja Turtles. Now here's your first caution in this mission. Which I guess I could see how that was like jump. But I guess it could have, in my opinion, it could have also been a uh, kick as well because she really did kick the enemy. And that's one thing you gotta be careful of in this game. If your enemy has a gun, make sure you disarm them as quick as possible uh, unless they have those, uh, those like perma, perma guns or perma weapons that never like go away. And as I said before, I just think that's funny, like, every character in the game, every, like, male character in the game actually does that poor baby thing. And now, and now these two are actually in all three missions, but depending on what mission you choose, they might be in a different, uh, a different room, making it different. Because I remember in one of the missions, uh, it, they were actually fought in that room with the fire going down, like, down the, uh, from front to back of the room. And it always seems like when I face these two enemies, I always defeat one of them, like, much before the other. It's, they never seem to stick together, and it's not like I'm really even, like, aiming at one, I'm just trying to, like, cause as much destruction as possible, because, you know, they're two fairly large enemies, and if you let them, uh, gang up on you, then, um, yeah, you're not gonna be around too long. And that's one thing I really like about this game, is how colorful some of the graphics are. Everything just looks really nice. And where is that girl? Find her and bring her to me. And you notice in this version of the mission, instead of her, her, uh, it being very silly and her hiding in the suitcase, which... I always thought it was really dumb, it's like, the bad guys don't realize, oh, there's a suitcase here, I wonder where the girl we're looking for could be. Could she be hiding in said suitcase? Nah, I don't think so, she, she's definitely not in that suitcase. But, um, yeah, the, instead of the suitcase, this time she's actually hiding in under the bed, which, while it's another very cliche place for somebody to hide, and somebody not to find them, it's at least a little bit better than the suitcase. And you'll see a little bit later in this mission, there's something unique about this mission that actually is not in the other two missions. And that's one thing you always want to do, I probably mentioned in the other videos, always ca grab the health power-ups before it shifts to the next scene. 
And now you'll see pretty much that she kicked that guy in the same way, but instead of it being jump, it was kick. And now here's your uh, stereotypical bathroom scene. I probably mentioned this in numerous videos, but whenever I see a scene like this, it always makes me think of that uh, gunfight in the movie True Lies, where at the end the bathroom is totally destroyed, the floor is completely flooded, and the like the one dude who is actually using the bathroom, uh, that he comes out of the bathroom and Arnold says something to him like, "Oh, sorry about all this." And he's, like, there with his pants around his ankles, and they're, like, all in the water, and you're like, that would be horrible, really. But this is, like, some some bathroom. There's, like, a counter over there. There's there's only four bathroom stalls for as ginormous it is, and there's all urinals on the side. And then there's this, like, big console of six sinks. The one thing I think is kind of weird is how easily the urinals break, but I guess they didn't want them to be more of a uh, weapon than they already were. And I think this is the first enemy with permaguns here, this guy here who's for no un no reason not using them and I while I'm pounding on his friend. Speaking of which, he finally used his permaguns, which doesn't make any sense how he was just kind of standing around there while the other enemy was getting pounded. And I know I probably made mention of this in the first video, but seeing all the caution parts just makes me think of uh, uh, playing uh, the Sega Ages Dynamite Deca and having to read all the cautions in Japanese. And, as I had mentioned multiple times at this point, the uh, actual, what I actually had on my desk when I was playing that game is all of the, uh, the hiragana for the uh, actual, like, punch, jump, kick written out on an actual thing, so I knew which was which, because the problem was, is in that game at least, I'm not sure if it's prevalent in all the games, but the actual cautions, what you had to do was random. Because I remember when I was first playing, I was like, oh, it's, so it's punch first, then kick, then jump. And then it turned out it was kick, jump, punch, and it just seemed random. I was like, oh, dang, I, I have to actually know what I'm reading when I do these. Which I think I did pretty good, but not so well. And now one big thing you will notice in this as opposed to the other one is this is kind of like a Japanese type thing. Like a Japanese restaurant type design, so it's a little bit different than Mission 1 was. And now, I don't know if you noticed that, but when the enemy is on the ground, a thing appears at his feet, like it looks like a weapon to pick up. You can actually pick him up and use him as a weapon. And that was a bit of me being a little dumb. I was just standing there when there was actually a, um... There was actually a, uh, life thing there. And that's one that was kind of weird that it's kick. I always thought that should be jump, because you're actually jumping. Now, if she slid feet first, I'd say, yeah, absolutely, kick. And now you'll see, as opposed to the stereotypical chef he was in the first one, he's actually this, like, big Japanese, like, sushi chef, and there's all these fish. But the same thing of uh, grenades was in the refrigerator, just like in the other one. But of course you have to be careful if he's too close to you, because he does that crazy roll. Which I'm pretty sure when I'm playing Mission 3, I actually figured that out, and I'm actually trying to get away from him. Because the actual thing to remember here is, when you're facing one of these guys, have something between him and you, because what will happen then is, you can still throw the grenades at him, because your, your character's actually throwing them. It's not like, uh, you have to have, uh, the, like, the ground between you two with no obstructions. But, um, when you actually have the, uh, obstruction between you and him, he can't get you with that roll, but you can still throw the grenades at him. I don't know if you saw them. In the bottom right corner, there are actually a few rice cookers that you can throw at him that will blow up. 
but I'm not sure if I actually do it here or not. At this point, I was just trying to pour on the whole, uh, the whole powered up mode on him because I have that extra edge. And apparently you can, uh, smack him on the ground like that, too. And see, those were those rice cookers I was mentioning that will blow him up. Yet. Never mind. It's time. Honestly, I really don't think that makes all that much sense that, like, a good deal of the ship blew up, but somehow it is still floating. And, like, you're still in it. I don't understand if, like, you were down here in the, the hold, and, like, you saw water started to seep in, because it would make a lot of sense, because you would be, uh, in a ship that was sinking, and you'd see water in the background coming in, kind of like on um, the Titanic, like, if you saw ever saw the movie Titanic, there are scenes where they're, like, low in the ship and there's water rushing in. That would have made a lot more sense than the ship being blown up, you still being on it. And, um, and it not sinking. You see, now that's one of those weapons that I think, but I don't know if I made mention of this in the other video, but you're throwing apples at them. I just imagine, like, the the one bad guy who survives, uh, Wolf, wolf uh, the, the bad guy Wolf would be asking the guys, so what did she use to defeat you guys? Well, you see, the, the two henchmen... They, she threw apples at them. Like... And then what happened? Well... I guess they were knocked out and killed. And he looks at them and goes, With apples? Really? Because it's just one of those weapons. I guess... I guess if you threw apples hard enough and enough apples at somebody, it would be like a big deal, but... It just doesn't seem like one of those, like, majorly bad weapons you would think, Oh, this is really gonna take somebody out. And if you didn't watch my first video or any of my other videos on this game, this is being run on the Sega Model 2B hardware. It's actually- this is actually the real game being run on the real hardware captured by the Elgato Game Capture HD. As you had seen in uh, my How I Capture Arcade Games video, this would use a custom cable I created connected to the filter board of the Model 2 and then into the 5-pin connector on the GBS-8200. And then that gets patched into the, uh, HD the VGA to HDMI and then into the Elgato. Quickly! And of course, as I had mentioned, that uh, upscaler will upscale the game to 720p, so the uh, so the game capture HD can actually capture this footage at a proper uh, a proper resolution. And now this was the stage I had mentioned earlier when I was fighting that uh, those two uh, those two big enemy people earlier that um, the big uh, that they actually were fought in in one of the playthroughs. And of course, you can see that guy taking full advantage of his perma guns, and uh, they do that thing where they roll over and they shoot you with your, gun your guns if you're uh, in a certain place, which is not fun. Now, it's one thing to be careful of in this area is the fire going up and down those channels. I don't know if it has an exact order or if it's just it goes by you. Which, it looks like it might have an exact order, because I'm not all the way over there, and it's all the way over there. But, the thing I like about a lot of these hazards is they actually, um, hurt the enemies, too. It's not one of those games where, like, there'll be flying bullets only hurting you, and the enemies will be completely unfazed. In this game, when fire comes up, it's gonna burn your character, but it's also gonna burn the enemies. Yeah! 
And that's one thing I definitely love in this game is the powered up modes because they make your character a lot more effective for all the uh, all the combination attacks. And now here is the uh, the the Kraken, which I think this is the same like area I fought him in Mission One as well. And of course, if you hadn't seen my first video, this is one of those fights that makes me think of other other octopus enemies and other uh, Kraken enemies, like the one in the quest mode for the game Air Gates. Because it seems like it's one of those sea creatures, because it's such a big sea creature that it's more often used as a uh, big boss, not like a standard enemy, because of course, something like this would be a bit too big to just be fought as like a regular old enemy. So it makes plenty more sense that it's actually fought as a big boss. And since my character was powered up for part of this fight, I don't think this fight took as long and was as um, hard as the other one. Honestly, I think what she should have done was she should have just started shooting instead of saying, wait, don't move. And if you haven't guessed it already, considering in the last uh, mission we were actually... I was actually, like, swimming in that scene. The thing that this mission does not have, the other two missions does have, you never actually leave the ship in this, in this mission. You always, uh, you're always on the ship the whole time. So, it seems kind of out of place that the tribal guys that are just randomly in the casino. But the cool part is that you still get the big slot machine where you can, uh, you can kick it and have stuff come out of it. And in this, uh, gameplay you even have the, uh, the whole casino with the, uh, the roulette table and the little slot machines and everything. Which, the little slot machines just animate on their own. There's no, like, rhyme or reason to them. Whereas the big one is only when you and one of the, or one of the enemies will uh, hit it, and as I'd said, that can cause the uh, can cause stuff to come out if you get the right uh, winning play. But as I was mentioning, it makes no sense that these tribal guys are here because it makes plenty of sense that they'd be on like some random remote island. But um, it doesn't make any sense that they're just randomly on the boat on this scene. Unless the bad guy actually uh, decided to bring a bunch of them on board, figuring, well, what if we don't get to the island and those guys were there to back me up? So I better bring some of them on the ship because that'd be a lot better. But that's the only thing that'd make any sense. And now the only way I've ever seen to stop those guys from multiplying is when they're about to multiply, if you hit them, it'll stop them. And of course, I just imagine the scene you're seeing right now actually replaces the scene on top of the big like, on top of the big like pier slash dock type thing on the island. And then the guy that like you hit there with the machine guns, he replaced that random dude who would, you would have to do the caution for. So that's how this would play out. And as opposed to the earlier mission where I got to this place first, since you were power shooting down from the top of the ship, this is kind of like the uh, one of the last stages of the game. Which is kind of interesting that the, uh, the game plays out differently than it would just because you chose a different mission. 
And from what I can tell, this has nothing to do with what character you're playing as. It just has to do with, um, what mission you chose. And you can see the Blast City Arcade games are still here. And they still have the same explosive, uh, consequences for the enemies. I think that was re a really cool thing for Sega to do there, even considering it's called a Blast City and it creates a blast. Now I know I made comment about this in the last mission gameplay. Oh, there was the, uh, yeah, that's how I learned that if you hit those guys before they're gonna multiply, they will not multiply. He's fish bait by now. And what I was gonna say is that was one of the only uh, times when I actually stopped those guys from multiplying. And more or less it leads to the whole fact that you just have to hit them right as they're gonna multiply and that'll just kill them instead. And of course, this is the same boss as you'd face on the island in Mission 1. And I believe it only is Mission 1 where you see that, uh, that chicken leg, uh, creature in the cage that was from Golden Axe, which is actually a cool little nod there from Sega themselves about their, one of their own games. And now what you had to do there, like when he was on top of her, if you mashed the button, it actually made you flip over and turn the tables on him. Which is really cool, of course. So there you are. I've been expecting you. I have changed my body to destroy you. Now, let's have some fun. Now, regardless of what actual mission you play, this fight pretty much plays out in the same way. Except for in the, um, the island scene. You have that, like, there's, like, a little piece of, like, a, a tree stump type thing that you can hide behind when he tries to shoot your myth, his, uh, bullets at you. And I find it kind of weird how the president's daughter is just kind of sitting there. And for some reason, it wasn't until this actual playthrough that I figured out that whole, uh, that whole, like, kind of sidestep type motion that you can do. And now that I'm actually seeing this footage again, I actually think it's quite impressive how how well it shows like the backdrop of the ship, and it definitely looks like the character is like on like the top deck of the ship, as opposed to just being on some area that just has like a, a background just painted as a big man image. Now this is probably one of those boss fights that's probably a lot easier if you have like two characters because. When you only have one character, no matter what, you're the you're the person he's focusing on, so it's very hard to uh, get away from his various attacks. And of course, when he grabs you and he stabs like that, it's very damaging. But of course, not as bad as him shooting the bullets out of his head can be. And it's one of those fights that if you try to, like, really beat him hard, he will just, like, spin around like that and do the gun thing again. And, and when I had got shot that before, that was one of those things where I was in his line of fire, and if I'd done the sidestep thing, I probably would have sidestepped the same way and still been in the line of fire. And as I'd mentioned in the uh, first gameplay, as he gets toward the end of the battle, he uses he uses that machine gun out of his head a lot more than he would have in the uh, in the earlier stages. 
And I find it kind of weird how the president's daughter just kind of, kind of like, is laying down in the corner there and, and just kind of like swaying back and forth. Something tells me if this game was actually made today, they probably would have made it so that she had a life bar too, and if the uh, bad guy actually shot that way, he would actually hurt the president's daughter. So it would kind of be like a boss fight plus escort mission, which of course would be very annoying. And now one interesting side fact about uh, Dynamite Decca 2 slash Dynamite Cop. Well, after this cutscene here. Thank you for saving my life again. I was gonna say one interesting fact about uh, Dynamite Decca 2 slash Dynamite Cop was it actually had kind of like a uh, remake slash reimagining of it called uh, Dynamite Decca EX Asian Dynamite, which of course like a lot of really cool arcade games was only released in Japan and only released in the arcades, and that game actually ran on Naomi One. And a lot of people think that it was actually based off of the Sega Dreamcast version of this game, but they completely reskinned and redid all the levels. But the actual like, the actual like uh, levels themselves were laid out the same. They just had different graphics. Well, this has been another Game Nexus arcade video, and I shall see you in my next video. Bye.